Good morning and welcome to our CAPIT webinar today. We're excited to have all of you with us. Um, today we're going to be talking about partnership and recruitment, finding program participants in post-COVID economic recovery. Our presenters today are Eric Selenow from JFF and Andrea messing Mathy from JFF as well. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. All of the attendees are in listen-only mode, and so you will be able to post questions in the question box, or if you would like to raise your hand, please go ahead and raise your hand, and we'll be able to unmute you, and you can comment. Uh, this is very similar to the webinar we had last week, where um, we can control the muting and unmuting, but if your microphone's working, we'd love to have you participate today. Just a couple extra things. Um, the webinar is being recorded, and we will be sharing out um, resources. Um, Andrea and Eric and I will share off resources afterwards. Um, but with that, I'm going to hand the floor over to Andrea and let us get started. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, I hope everyone is doing well and safe. Um, it is very rainy up here in Chicago, so depending on where you happen to be in the rest of the state, um, or Eric in Delaware, I'm not sure what it's like there for you folks. So today we're going to be talking about partnership and recruitment, um, finding economic, finding program participants in a post-COVID <clears throat> economic recovery. Um, assuming we're not quite there yet, but we will be. Um, and and part of our hope today is to have a discussion about where you are at in your current partnership and recruitment what are some resources that you're tapping into um, how are you um, envisioning partnership and recruitment are there particular populations that you're looking to recruit from are there resources that you specifically know that you need? Um, so this is going to be very much kind of a fluid conversation. Um, I know there's kind of a, the, the hands up gesture. I know Amy's really great about, about monitoring that. Um, but please know that the chat box is there for you to use to, to bring some ideas out to the floor. And we're hoping that towards the end of this conversation that we can really have an open discussion about this work. So um, as Amy said, Eric Zeltzenow is joining me on our, um, on our discussion. Um, so on the agenda today, um, again, is um, COVID-19 kind of where are we now? Um, along with that, the impacts on apprenticeships and what we can do. How does this impact partnership and recruitment? And then again, an open discussion. So I'm going to actually kick it to Eric a little bit um, to talk about kind of COVID-19, some of the kind of broader economic realities that we've seen. Um, and one of the things that, you know, just kind of talk about kind of where some of the short-term labor market outcomes have really hit. Um, but Eric, do you want to give a little conversation about kind of some of the broader nuances about COVID-19 and the economic outlook? Sure, Andrea, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm in, uh, I'm, I'm in our Washington office, but I'm staying down uh, in Delaware because there's a lot less cases down here by the shore in Delaware. Uh, it's a beautiful day here, a uh, little cool still. Uh, anyway, thanks for making the time to join us. Um, you know, this isn't a rocket science conversation, but you know, we have a little bit of a benefit to talking to programs all over the country. Um, and Department of Labor and um, and others. So we're we're trying to get a sense or a profile <clears throat> into what's really going on with COVID and impacting this particular work. And I think it's a big problem. It's not an insurmountable one, uh, but it will be for the short term uh, and hopefully not the long term. And so what we're hearing across the country, certainly, you know, the National Restaurant Association, the American Hotel and Lodging Association have gotten creamed by this. Um, a lot of their apprenticeship programs have just stopped, uh, workers laid off, furloughed, paused, whatever, um, and it's been particular in the hotel and hospitality industry um, and the restaurant industry. Um, you know, manufacturing um, has had some stalling and some data showing uh, some recent layoffs, and I think in Illinois that's something to keep an eye on. Um, uh, but some companies are hiring. Um, you know, we talked to a major national company the other day that said, hey, we were scheduled to take on, you know, five apprentices and we're going we're gonna to do that. Uh, we have a safe work environment and we're going to continue with that. Others have sort of shifted their uh, related technical instruction, the classroom portion of their apprenticeship work, um, to virtual, as I'm sure many of you have done uh, throughout your colleges and your platforms. And so some have shifted their related technical instruction. So they're saying, all right, you can't go to work. You can't do your on the job learning part at this point till they open things up. So let's focus on your related technical instruction or your training. 
Uh, the other big thing that's been going on is, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure this has been a factor with some of your students, um, probably many of your students, uh, and that is, you know, look, we're not talking about apprenticeship today. We're talking about unemployment insurance, and here's where you need to go on the state website to file for unemployment insurance and your pandemic unemployment insurance and getting people some of the resources they need since they can't work full-time or part-time, you know, in some industries and occupations. So it's sort of a mixed bag across the country. I think uh, one of our, our philosophy on this, and we wrote a blog on it on our website, which I'll drop into the chat later, um, and think maybe we even did it the other day, I'm not sure. But, you know, look, apprenticeship in this country the last five years has had incredible growth and incredible attention to it, and we can't let the progress of that slip away. Um, we got to maintain and sustain what we've developed uh, to this point. And I think, you know, just, you know, DOL, I don't know what they've told ICCB, but we've been in many conversations with DOL about deliverables and outcomes and and what is the impact on existing grants and contracts because, oh my gosh, we're not going to be able to make the numbers. <clears throat> and DOL has taken a wait and see flexibility case by case approach there. They understand what the issues are that are going on. They know it impacts some of the ultimate numbers of this. Um, so they're not wholesaling changing anything, but, you know, working with your grant officer, uh, which I know the ICC B folks will do, there'll be some flexibility, and I'm sure some of that flexibility will be passed to you. But, you know, the long and short of it um, is uh, this is going to be tough for you all to sort of get the on-the-job learning going until things loosen up. So new apprentices are often the first to go. Uh, there's been a lot of momentum. Um, you know, during the last recovery, and this is very different than the previous uh, recess, Great Recession back in 2008, where we lost 86,000 apprentices. Actually, I think it was more than that, but that's all the data I can find on it. And of course, you know, that decline is always tied to demand. Now, a lot of you all are looking at the IT industry. Again, it's a mixed bag, you know, small and medium sized, but even some large businesses are you know, certainly not hiring or holding or furloughing or even laying off people. So, you know, that's going to make uh, part of your work a little tougher. Uh, next slide, please, Andrea. I think we have another slide. Sure. Here. And if um, I can just jump in here, yeah. I, I think this is some really interesting context that I wanted to offer out for folks. So SHRM did a study. Um, they did a, they worked with the National Association of Colleges and Employers. Um, I'm doing a really informal quick poll a few weeks ago on internships and apprenticeships and the new reality. And you can see kind of how the coronavirus pandemic is impacting some of those apprenticeships, right? So there's a huge number that are canceling them. Um, but then there's some that are actually transitioning those to micro apprenticeships that are shorter than the typical 10 to 12 week internship. Um, and they're changing the format of the apprenticeship to online or virtual because of COVID. And I think this particular quote, and this is from the director of FinTech, um, a Charlotte, um, North Carolina um, uh, techni like Financial Technical Industry Association, is that this, I think things will change forever after this, but it will probably be some mixture of physical and virtual format. We want this experience to mimic the real life work environment. I think that real life work environment is going to change for the in the future. So I think this is an opportunity for us to think about how we're going to have to change the way we do apprenticeships going forward. We're going to have to change the way we do work going forward. Um, and I think this offers a unique unique way to think about this, particularly in the IT industry. And Eric started talking about this, um, but the IT industry is going to be impacted by the economic downturn. So many IT occupations, um, in particular IT support, may actually show some more resiliency than others. So we're starting to see some data come out about roles related to remote work or data storage or telecommuting and telecom, and then specifically software, cybersecurity, remote working platforms may actually see some dramatic increases in growth. So it's a little bit more nuanced than I think any of us anticipated. Um, so Eric, I'm not sure if you wanna add anything extra to that. No, I just think, uh, and I've been saying this all over, I still, this is great data by the way, Andrea. Um, I know it's limited, but it, you know, it helps. I, um, you know, I. I um, I think we can't let these sort of things slow us down. I think this is great data to be understanding. Um, I think things are changing on a regular basis. So, you know, it's hard to predict what the future is going to be, whether this quote's going to be accurate. 
how long is it going to be like this? Will it change? Will things go back to normal? We just don't know yet in many places. Um, but certainly the news is not great. Um, but you know, all of this still reflects the reality of the workforce, and we've got to work. You've got to work with your students, your apprenticeships, your internships, all of those folks in the context of this real world. So, so, uh, so it it it's a tough situation. Absolutely but, true. Yep. Yeah. But I think that what hasn't changed. Um, is most of our approaches, our strategies, and our key elements, like the things that we still hold to be true about apprenticeships, right? That we're still going to continue to engage intermediaries to market apprenticeships. That's still crucial. Um, we're still going to empower them to provide ongoing management support. Intermediaries, um, like community colleges in many cases, provide a really crucial um, connection point between employers and apprentices, and between employers, apprentices, and social services, and other education institutions. We're still going to look to leverage federal, state, and local resources to underwrite training costs and educate stakeholders on the apprenticeship model and its comparative advantages. Um, we're still going to foster pathways for underrepresented populations to access apprenticeship that's still incredibly crucial and access industry credentials and academic credit to embed apprenticeships in career advancement strategies, which is something I think that we spent a lot of time talking about two weeks ago um, and we'll talk about again in a few weeks um, when we kind of dig into the program model a little bit deeper. So I think this is where we kind of get into the who is there to support um, and on the issues of partnership and recruitment I think this is a small snapshot right and this is where I would love us to start having kind of a more open discussion um, and Eric dive in here whenever you're ready but mm -hmm. as we think about kind of connecting to labor partners like who in the local union is there to support um, who at the AFL-CIO is there to support employer associations um, connecting the state and community partners, your Illinois WorkNet centers. Um, and I know that they're closed, but there are folks there that can help you. Um, veteran support systems if you're trying to target veteran populations. Um, the United Way and other local CBOs. So there are there are places where the folks are that you're trying to recruit, the, the bodies that you're trying to recruit from, they're there and they're they're being supported by other organizations across the landscape. Eric, I'm not sure if you want to jump in here. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know what to say. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think this is good info to have. I think we're going to have to feel our way through it a little bit with our companies. And I'm anxious to hear from you all shortly about if or what you're hearing from your local companies. I'm finding out there are regional differences. I'm sure what Paula's experience in Chicago might be very different than what's going on in in uh, you know Springfield or uh, you know Southern Illinois, and you know there are regional differences in all of this. So it'll be interesting to see what, what we're hearing from your employers. You, go, you can go on, Andre. Sure. So I'm wondering if we want to pause here and just find out from from folks on the webinar. Um, are, as you're looking at recruiting from um, your local populations, who are you partnering with? And I don't know, Amy, if it's worth unmuting folks or if we want to do hand raising. <clears throat> Let's have people raise their hand in case there are background noises. So anybody mm -hmm. who raises their hand, I'm happy to unmute. Well, we can just kind of keep that pause there. Just know oh. that if you raise your hand. Yes, go ahead. Oh, sorry, there's Thompson hand. would like to share. No, Paul, let's go. talk to Paul. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Paul. Um, yeah, so um, I guess I was going to just share a little bit about kind of uh, we, we uh, got asked the question. So, you know, like what's been the impact of um, the uh, pandemic on our apprenticeship, the health of our apprenticeship programs? And I think we were speaking to it you know, uh, much more anecdotally, but we went back and, and this is not an exact science because it's, you know, we're like extracting information from notes and that kind of thing, but it's a, a decent snapshot. Uh, we went back and looked at our dashboard from um, March 12th, which was kind of like right before things, um, you know, hit the fan. Mm -hmm. And uh, we looked at the health of our programs in three dimensions. Uh, one, 
um, program development, like who are the companies and partners we're working with who have said, hey, you know, I know we're working on this program, but we're going to need to put that on hold uh, or, you know, pull back completely um, versus continuing to work on the program. We also looked at recruiting. Um, in in uh, early March, we were recruiting for a whole uh, host of uh, apprenticeship spots. Uh, of course, more of them on the non-register side as opposed to the registered side. Uh, and we looked at, you know, um, you know, recruiting as a as a indicator of current demand. Um, and then what are those outcomes? Either they were put on hold or they were actually placed. Um, and then we looked at apprentices in place, uh, apprentices who are actually, you know, out there already working at uh, companies and how many of those, uh, how many of those situations have changed. And, and so what we found is that um, in the program development um, area that, you know, there was a pretty significant decline. <clears throat> so we had uh, seven uh, different programs we were working on in March. Um, and as of last week in April, that's, that's moved down to four. So, you know, a, a, a number of them have been put on hold. There, there were programs that were put on hold prior to March. Uh, but, you know, we've gone from, from seven to four. Uh, that we were working on. So three, you know, got placed on hold. Uh, in terms of recruiting demand, um, in uh, mid-March, we were recruiting for 72 different apprenticeship uh, spots. Um, and then that number has dropped to 52. So uh, we, we've lost about 20 spots. Now, uh, coincidentally, the, we had three people who were placed into apprenticeships during that period. Um, and so um, it's it's more like an 18 uh, spot drop as opposed to a, a 20 spot drop, but still, uh, you know, fairly significant 24% uh, decline. And then in terms of the apprentices in place, uh, we had 86 apprentices in place in March, um, and uh, we had 88 apprentices uh, in place um, at the end of this period, uh, which is uh, just two more. And considering there were three placements, that means one person was um, lost their job, was terminated, and that was unrelated. It was because of a background check. So I guess the summation of that is that we're seeing a uh, big movement on the front end, on the program development. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some decline, not quite as big on the recruiting side, um, because I think people are still holding out. I mean, some of these positions we're recruiting for are for like, you know, August and September spots. So I think some people are just, you know, thinking, hey, things will be resolved enough that we'll be able to continue mm -hmm. by then. And then uh, really good, uh, really flat numbers in terms of um, uh, apprentices in place that are remaining in place. So I just wanted to share that as uh, kind of what's going on in Chicago with uh, City yeah, Paul, College. This, Paul, this is Eric. Um, when you did that, did you happen to look at it by industry? Um, and which industries maybe had a higher uh, hold rate or rate? I, I did not. I mean, that's something I can uh, certainly go back and, and look at. This was um, uh, something we needed to produce, you know, yeah. pretty quickly. Um, yeah. So um, no, that's great data. Um, this is great data, Paul. And, and actually, you know, it, uh, gives me some optimism, right? Because we keep hearing mm -hmm. across the country about a mixed bag, right? Um, you know, some places everything's been frozen, some places uh, not. So you know, to have, you know, 25, 33% uh, changes is not as bad as it could be. Uh, but again, right. we'll see things are changing every week, but uh, a helpful yeah. snapshot of where you are. Very helpful. Thank you. And, and yeah. our, our, our thought is that we would actually continue to monitor this on a weekly basis. Um, and so that we can begin to, to really draw some trend lines as to, you know, kind of like what's happening going forward. Um, the, the other thing I would mention is that uh, one of the things that I think we have to figure out pretty quickly is, um, you know, almost all of these apprentices are working uh, remotely. Um, and it's one thing to hire someone, uh, onboard them, have them come into the organization, then put them on remote work schedule. It's another thing to do all of those functions remotely. Right. Um, and I think there's a, a certain discomfort that companies have with doing that. Like, you know, they're throwing their hands up, like, how in the, in the world can I even do that? 
Um, and Accenture is actually, uh, they've, they've actually done that before and, uh, and, and they're uh, doing that, they're going, they're planning to do that with their apprenticeships. And so one of the things I've asked the Accenture folks to do is, you know, anything you can document or, you know, anything we can put together that like really uh, talks about the ins and outs and the best practices around, you know, onboarding and, and deployment of equipment and, uh, you know, getting somebody up to speed uh, completely remotely would help give comfort to companies who are trying to get their minds wrapped around that. Absolutely. Yeah, if any way that Accenture can be helpful, and if there's any way that we can be helpful to help spearhead that or help shepherd that, let me know, um, because I think I think that could actually be really useful to the field in general. Um, Paul, I'm wondering if you can speak just really quickly, um, and I'm just going to click to the next slide, um, about where your recruitment, like what's your recruitment strategy? So I know you have this community college network as all of you do, um, right? But the community college network, um, is that all you're using for recruitment strategy or are you connecting with community partners kind of in, in a really intentional sort of way in order to think about kind of where you're recruiting from your populations? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we've got kind of a, uh, a, a two-phased approach. Um, the first phase, is and I think I talked about this last time we were together. Um, I've got this uh, basic certificate that's going to exist across the entire footprint of um, our, our city colleges district, and we're going to leverage that as uh, a big component of a pre apprenticeship program. Mm -hmm. So that is going to be my main driver in terms of bringing uh, that talent into, uh, into the opportunity for the apprenticeship. Uh, we are also beyond that. I know there are programs that exist um, with the um, Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership. Um, I know there's uh, some some other IT programs that are out there in the community that also um, um, Evanston Partners. There's there's probably um, a half dozen that I know about mm -hmm. or heard of, and probably twice as many uh, that I don't know about. Uh, but really trying to figure out how to connect them um, as a as a bridge to um, either the apprenticeship program or to the pre apprenticeship program uh, to to tap into that talent outside of city colleges. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. How about other folks? I'm wondering. I mean, if we can. Oh, yeah, sorry, Eric. Right. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you had a question. No, I just put a finer point on that question to the others, right? So. We've talked about this before, and I know you've only been working on this project for a little while, but you know, other partners, uh, as you set up your programs after, over these last six months or tried to set up your programs uh, remotely, um, some of you are going to connect to local workforce boards, some of you are going to connect to community organizations, some of you chambers or, or elsewhere. Um, uh, so those of you who are not in Chicago, um, were you planning to do that? Have you been able to do that? Most one stops if they're uh, not closed. I like to say they're closed. They've just gone to virtual services um, and they're really not doing much else these days than UI, unemployment insurance processing and immediate assistance to dislocated workers. But I would say that dislocated workers, people who've been laid off through no fault of their own, Wonder we owe a, are going to be there's going to be some excellent candidates floating around for your program. So I'm I'm curious as to what other partnerships you have um, outside of Chicago and if you've been able to get them going. Have they stalled? Um, and uh, that's one of my questions. And I have another one relative to your programming and recruitment of students. But at this point, it's a partnership question, and uh, would love to hear from. Angela or Bernie or Brooke or Cindy or Joy or anybody else on uh, these sort of things. And if you're not, that's fine too. Um, or if you've tried to and couldn't because the because uh, of the pandemic, then that's we'd like to hear about that too. So we'll just open that up for one of you all. Yep, Bernie. Shocking to see your hand raised. <laughs> Bernie, we can't hear you, so make sure you're not on mute. I think that was you. Can you hear me now? There you go, Bernie. Yep. Hey, how are you? Good. Doing well, sir. Um, we, I get pretty much, 
Go pretty ahead, much Brian. across the board, everybody is, um, they're not pulling back in the sense of we're not going to do it. Uh, they're pulling back in the sense that um, they don't know when and where. And one man said it best. He says, we've committed to having an apprentice. Uh, our IT manager is all for it. Uh, the issue right now is um, we don't know when to start them. We don't want to start them and then turn around and say, we got to stop. Right. Right. And uh, actually they have a huge, one of them, one of them has a, a fairly large project. They want the intern uh, or in this case, the apprenticeship. Uh, we call it an intern because we do a thing with the Illinois cooperative work study program. And, uh, and that's a great way to get the door open if you have the program. Uh, they want them to do, uh, start the program and then as other people come available through uh, dual credit, it's a, it's a school district, they would, he would more or less um, manage those people to, to, to work on this project. It's not something that has to happen in a certain period of time. So it's a great, uh, what do you call, fill-in job. The other one uh, is a local business and he just flat out said, he says, well, it's all we could do to keep our customer base, you know, solid. And to start an apprentice is unfair to him, but it's a major, uh, how would you call it, goal that his leadership team wants to step into before the end of this year. Right. So well, you, you, get this, you, you see them, you call it playing a game of chess is what I'm saying. But, yeah. uh, and so we're not getting much help from like, well, without the school being functioning, it's hard to get uh, what we call feeder programs like WIOLA or TRIO, uh, dual credit. Uh, let me see here. Other ones. Those types of uh, like counseling get people across, as we call it, across the hall and say, yeah, I want to do that. OK. And it isn't very far to go. They don't have to do much other than the person gets them to stand up, walks across the hallway and away you go. So, so, um, yeah. so Bernie, so we, uh, we, we've heard that from across the country as well, what you're describing, um, what, uh, what, what seems, uh, what, what people are trying to do, and I'm sure you're trying to do this too, is to use this, uh, this time to do some strategic planning, right? And so to strengthen those relationships, you know, I, you know, when I was a, back, a job counselor back in the day and I was working with a lot of employers, I always try to create really close relationships with employers because I knew the economy wasn't always going to be good. And of course, when the economy was good, we're, you know, we're happy. Our programs are working great. When the economy goes south, it isn't. So it's always good to have those relationships for times like this. Um, and then to spend these, these downtimes, if you will, strategic planning. So those companies that you're talking to, which are very real life stories, you know, um, uh, particularly small and medium sized businesses, but okay, great. We understand that you can't do that now, but let's keep planning for when we get recovery or we've got a solid program. Maybe you had to do improvements on it. Maybe there was still some more planning, but that is um, often what we are hearing from sites now, uh, or we're hoping to hear from them. And some we do is that they're using this time to set up, to still do the work with employers, to still let employers know we understand what a position they're in, but that uh, recovery is going to happen at some point. We need to be ready to advance through that. So, um, you know, anything you all can do with your, I mean, you have pretty complicated programs, right, with your models of, you know, uh, bridge to pre to apprenticeship. So, uh, an internship and all those things Bernie was talking about. So, it's always good to still keep try to do the planning you still have this award you still have the funds to do it you have to show activity um so that strategic planning i think would be good either amongst yourselves or within your communities uh so yeah, that, i'm sorry bernie go ahead i'm sorry didn't mean to run over you one of the things that i find that helps out is you know you got this relationship but you don't know how strong it is because you got to have something uh you know to test it but as I'm going through and doing research, looking at stuff, and you come across uh, an apprenticeship model or some pieces of information that you could pull together, and then I send it out to the, right now, there's four, possibly five organizations that want to get an apprentice. They're straight to an apprentice, no pre-apprentice, none of that. Um, and you, you just share these bits of wisdom and what other people are doing. And every once in a while, you'll get a call back or an email that says, oh, great, Bern, that's some good information for us to know answer the question that we had. Lo and behold, I mean, I know these most of these people 
on a semi-personal basis, they they got my cell number, my personal cell. They didn't ask the question, but the question was floating around in their organization. Right. So you got to sort of like do the old-fashioned cold call and just yeah. throw it out there. Yeah. No, I think you're exactly right. And in times like this, um, those personal relationships that you have in your community are going to be really important, personal or professional. You know, people you see at chamber meetings or workforce board meetings or um, you know, just the, the a business community that's familiar with the college. I think it's it's great to to do that sort of follow up, uh, right? Because some people may be thinking about this, some people may not. So I think there's uh, some opportunities to keep those conversations going so they don't forget you. And then, you know, when when things do change, when Illinois starts to open up, um, you know, there might be some opportunities there. Cindy, did you want to get in on the conversation or share what's going on in your area, Cindy? Unmute yourself. Yep, Can you hear me now? Yep, we can. We can? Okay, great. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, Cindy Burnsich Drew uh, with Prairie State College. I hope everyone is well. Um, I wanted to start by saying that, uh, unfortunately, we had been having some issues with employer engagement prior to COVID-19 for the IT apprenticeship program. Um, and we had been doing some really, I think, great uh, outreach efforts to approach apprenticeship, including um, partnering with our career services department um, in terms of uh, internal resources, reached out to a lot of IT uh, companies that would uh, list on ZipRecruiter and Indeed, uh, reached out to our external partners, other apprenticeship programs and navigators for employer um, engagement and support, also reached out to our higher ed partners, uh, universities and other community colleges in an effort to promote transfer uh, students as well as identify employer right. partners. We also um, hosted a number of partnered events to promote apprenticeship benefits to employers. So I think all of those were really good um, and we weren't getting the employer engagement. So what we were um, doing currently, uh, to your point, Eric, is we're trying to plan for recovery. So we've been um, reaching out to other navigators and intermediaries to kind of talk through their best practices so that we can kind of get an, a sense for how we might be able to incorporate um, those outreach efforts now and, and moving forward. And, and some of the things we've talked about were those connections, um, you know, making sure that you are continuing to build the relationships, really figuring out what the employer needs are now and, you know, post COVID. Um, some of the things we talked about were smaller asks, you know, job mm -hmm. shadows um, when we can, um, employer presentations, and, and these can be done virtually. Um, internships, micro internships, we've been talking about kind of more of the buy before you cry. Right. And then moving into the bigger ask of, of apprenticeship so that when the economy does recover, we're in that position. We've built and you know maintain those relationships to then move to apprenticeship train to retain right you know i Cindy, i think that's an excellent strategy i hate to say it but i think it's an excellent strategy i think you know the situation is requiring us to do this um and if, if several of you are you know that's your approach as well i think you know from reporting that to dol is going to be very satisfactory uh may not get them the numbers they were hoping to get immediately but they'll see that you're out trying to do that work uh no longer, although we'll have to see what your federal <laughs> federal pro project officer says but but cindy i think i think that's right and um you know i'm curious too is um you know on the on the recruitment side not just the partner side um are you so like let's say an employer called you and said you know i'd take three students tomorrow in some sort of internship program would you have any trouble recruiting students or finding applicants to to do that i don't know if you're still there or not cindy no i, I am i'm unmuted now sorry about that um i don't We've not had so much with the, the student recruitment issue as we've had the employer engagement yep. issue. 
Yes. So I, I think that we would be okay on that end. Um, I think we've been hesitant to recruit more because of we want to make sure that we have the, um, the supply and the demand. Yep. yep, that's smart. No, yep. that's very smart. You know, the other thing to keep in mind as part of this partnership recruitment effort, and recruitment may not be a problem, right? But, you know, the other thing, and this, these are lessons from the Great Recession, right, in 2008 to 2011, where we lost 6,000 apprentices. But um, there's a, probably going to be about $15 billion that is going to go to the public workforce system and other programs uh, through some more um, uh, COVID bills coming out of uh, the House um, and the Senate, uh, coming out of Congress. Um, and the reason I want to bring that, I don't know what it's going to end up being, but there's uh, several congressional and senatorial folks who are working on this. Um, I think somebody from Illinois is on that. Um, but in any event, like they did back then, they're going to shoot a ton of money through the public workforce system. The public workforce system is not going to be able to spend it all, or we'll have trouble doing it. They'll get probably get a stream of funds to serve youth. They're going to get a stream of funds for adult workers, and they're going to get a big stream of fund for dislocated workers. Um, and the reason I mention that now is for, I know you all know who your local workforce board and one-stop people are, and Cindy, you talked about career services. Those relationships, I think, become very important uh, in supporting each other now and then into recovery when they might have tons of money, when they might need to make referrals of dislocated workers to you. I mean, you may have enough to do already with your existing student population, uh, but there may be some other opportunities and funding that comes up to sort of leverage against this. So I just I just wanted to mention that to keep an eye on that. Your career services or one-stop folks are important partners to, to stay in touch with. Um, I know diversity is also a big issue um you know for your project and and those other community-based organizations um uh because some of those communities have been hit so hard uh during covid that uh you know outreach to community-based organizations that serve lower skilled lower income folks who you can draw into these programs is also something to think about so there is no Absolutely. question yeah. yeah, no question. They're just an observation, but um, uh, but you know, and again, you know, now's now's the time to, to try to do that stuff. Although everybody is so preoccupied with this, it's hard, right? Um, uh, but but other good strategic uh, partnerships to make in this process. So I'm wondering if we want to hear from other folks. Um, about either the partnership or the recruitment side. Where have you been struggling? Where are you seeing some success? Um, just kind of open the, open the floor there. Bernie has his hand up again. Okay, Bernie. No, my hand is not up. Okay. <laughs> that, that's our hand. I'm sorry. Not one thing. No worries. It's okay. there anyone else? Okay, so I mean, we're kind of leave this here. Um, so one thing that I, I wanted um, to spend just a little time talking about, I'm going to try to move my screen. There it goes. So I'm having a little trouble with my screen. Um, <clears throat> is the populations that you're pulling from. So we've talked about this before, um, about the importance to kind of know your audience, know where you're trying to recruit from and what resources are available to them. So uh, Eric just mentioned resources for newly laid out workers. Um, there's, in, there's, there's resources for, I mean, the women in skilled trades are not as, as useful for you, um, for your purposes right now, but um, veterans, military spouses, opportunity youth, there are different resources for different audiences that are available to you. Um, and we can open this up to discussion, but I think we can also um, just pivot here for a moment um, and talk about specific populations and what resources might be available to them. So Whitney and I actually had a conversation. We had a chance to speak with um, Dan from Veterans Affairs, he was at our advisory board meeting in January, and his last name is escaping me, and I do apologize. Um, but 
I think one of the things that we'd like to do is bring some information to you about some of the supports for some of these specific populations, veterans being one of them. Um, and we can talk a little bit about kind of how um, how you actually recruit through different partners. Um, and there are various opportunities, um, whether it's through Veterans Affairs offices at your local community college, or there's community-based organizations um, like Hire Heroes um, and other organizations that directly support recruitment for veterans and directly have program supports for veterans. So we can just talk through this briefly, um, but some of the available resources, right? There's there's resources in Amer American Job Centers, transitional assistance programs, and local veterans programs. Um, there's veterans are eligible for GI Bill benefits and they can use them through it during an approved apprenticeship program. Um, that bill also allows monthly housing allowance in addition to apprenticeship wages. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities and options available for veterans um, that that I think maybe maybe will go untapped if if they're not realized. So Eric, I'm not sure if you want to speak to that at all. Uh, which which part of that? You asked seven questions in that, um, Andrea. Which I did. which. <laughs> Just kind of like the specific population. We can talk about veterans specifically, but we can also talk about more targeted populations. Yeah, I'm. You know, look, I, uh, there are particularly in IT companies, um, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, IBM, many of the other larger companies, and small and medium sized have focused on veterans, right? And with registered apprenticeships, um, and I'm, I, I guess you guys probably know this from the community college approval system, but for veterans to be approved um, for GI Bill benefits or the GI Bill housing allowance, um, they have to be in approved education and training programs. And those approvals have to come from the state uh, approval agencies, the veteran, uh, uh, they call them state approving agencies who approve educational curriculum for veterans. And I know a lot of colleges are connected to that. But what they changed a couple of years ago when I was at DOL was the um, uh, veterans benefits, uh, GI Bill benefits, and particularly the Housing Alliance for bona fide registered apprenticeship programs. Um, and if it's registered, uh, each state a veterans approval agency has to approve them, which really should not be a heavy lift. Uh, if they're registered, they should approve them. Um, and then if a student is involved in a registered apprenticeship program, then they would get a GI Bill housing allowance of a little bit over a thousand a month. Um, uh, I think it operates, you know, it's a federal program, but I'm sure it operates that way in Illinois as well. So, you know, for registered, there is a pathway in for veterans, a matter of fact, uh, later on this week, I'm doing a webinar with Department of Labor Veterans Office on attracting veterans to apprenticeship programs, uh, hiring our heroes sort of thing. Um, but it's all, you know, registered programs also keeps them engaged in getting their benefits. Now, that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is just, you know, it's the right thing to do to try to recruit those folks in what you're, what you're trying to do. So, uh, and a lot of IT companies like that, a lot of these, uh, and this is not just veterans, it's also their spouses. Um, who are eligible, uh, so don't forget that. But if any in any of your recruiting, um, and you know in the one-stop centers, and when I used to run a one-stop years ago, this is what we do, uh, you know, we would talk to some of the businesses and say, you know, in every one-stop across this country, there are veteran staff in there. They're called DVOPs, Disabled Veteran, uh, I forget what the acronym is, uh, Specialists, and uh, LVERs, um, local veterans employment representatives, but they're in every one stop. And uh, the purpose of those is to connect, you know, veterans into the public workforce system or colleges or whatever. So if you have an employer that wants to focus on veterans or if veterans is something that you're interested in doing, I would highly recommend you contact your local workforce folks, your board chair or whoever, not board chair, but director, whoever that is, and get connected to those DVOPs and LVRs. In some states, they're good. In some states, not so good. And when someone stops, they're good. Some not so good. But in any case, they have all the information about any benefits that these folks are available. And if you need to recruit a course, you know, they deal with probably, hun you know, hundreds in your jurisdiction of which they could refer to you and do some screening and they might even have some money for training for them. So a couple of options good for that. Um, uh, you know, for non-registered programs, uh, I don't believe there's any benefit uh, 
uh, GI Bill benefit unless there is curriculum at the college that the college has approved, uh, then they would be eligible for those benefits as well. But in many cases, it's a twofer. Amazon has had great success in IT. Uh, IBM, Microsoft has, but there's also a number of medium and small companies that have done the th same thing. And there may be a small company that says, look, I just want to hire one. Um, and mm -hmm. that's what they do. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, you know, maybe they'll get benefits, maybe they won't, but it's something you ought to have your folks be screened for. Just a, an, another, you know, group that needs some purpose and intentionality to recruit. Um, some folks will say, oh, we want to hire an ex-offender. Uh, you know, we really want to help somebody. Okay, it requires a fair amount of screening on that, but you know, that's something. Or, you know, we want to hire, you know, somebody with a disability, or we want to hire, you know, you'll find some employers that want to do that. Others are just looking for the most talented person they could get. So, uh, uh, you know, think about some of the underrepresented populations you want to serve. We know DOL is trying to advance that, something we're trying to advance. Um, and there are, you know, you know, you're going to have look, plenty of, as this slide will tell you, right, you have plenty of dislocated and laid off workers you'll have to choose from. Um, women in IT is something that's becoming a very large issue. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's been one and it's continued to be one. Veterans, spouses, of course, and then, you know, there's opportunity youth. Youth who are out of school or out of work. Again, typically some of your community-based organizations and one stops have connections to them. And then of course there's also any sort of you know in-school youth projects that you want to do. So there's plenty of special populations out there that need services um, uh, that you could uh, recruit. I'm sure you know whether students are on your campus now or you have to recruit from the community. There's a lot of leads. I I always preferred when I was in that space to work with uh, other organizations who could help do some screening and vetting of candidates before we got them. We didn't, we didn't want the college to recruit them directly. We would recruit them and screen them to what the college wanted and send them over to our friends, either in workforce develop or continuing ed or, or regular curriculum, wherever they were. So, uh, plenty of partners out there. The uh, lastly, you know, anything you can do, and I'll go back to what Andrea had in a previous slide is, you know, chambers, your business associations. Do you have an IT association? I know Illinois has a has a tech industry association. Are there regional ones or local ones? Uh, does the chamber have a tech committee, um, if you will? That you know they're still going to have some challenges. So anything you can do to help them would be great. And I want to just hone in on something that you said, Eric, about this idea around purpose and intentionality on recruitment. I, I think that often it can feel tr tremendously overwhelming. Um, whether it's recruiting businesses or recruiting participants. And I think if there's some real purpose and intentionality about who you're recruiting and for what purpose, right, and not what problem you're trying to solve, it can maybe maybe make the lift a little bit easier or a little bit clearer to understand. Um, so if you are trying to recruit veterans, there are resources available to you. If you're trying to re recruit dislocated workers, there are resources, there are partners that you can plug into. So you're not going it alone. Um, and I think that that's a really important part is that those partnerships are crucial for the recruitment and uh, of both employers and of um, participants. So really leveraging, doubling down on those partnerships as ways to, to kind of get at that, um, I think is incredibly important. So for the last 10 minutes that we have together, it's open discussion. Um, I wanted to just uh, kind of open the floor for any last questions, thoughts, um, concerns um, or ideas, innovations that you're coming up with um, that you think will be important to share with the group. So um, you can raise your proverbial avatar hand and Amy can, I can um, unmute you. We can also unmute all if we want to just see what we happens. We can unmute all and just see the Wild West, see what happens. <laughs> I'm okay with that. You want a free for all? Yeah. That'd be okay. So I have unmuted everybody. So if anybody wants to just start the conversation. I know I did see a little hand up, so I wasn't sure. I can start with so that So it says that all this is, attendees uh, Bobby have... from Parkland. There we go, Bobby. Hi, Bobby. Perfect. How are you? Hello there. Um, I don't have anything innovative to share. 
but I do kind of want to let you know (laughs) know what's happening at Parkland. Got a couple things. We were going to launch a couple bridges in uh, the uh, late spring in May, June, and uh, we're running into trouble with GED testing not being given. So, of course, that lends to some problems with Mm. some of the four credit courses we were trying to give. Um, And everything here has pretty much stopped uh, because two days, no, yesterday, God, it seems like it's been a week. Yesterday, we were hit with malware. So we are totally down. No access to anything, no files, no communication, no emails, no nothing. And they're trying to get things fixed, but we're really focusing on trying to keep the semester open for uh, academics first. So I've been watching our team's discussion and what's going on at the same time I'm doing this. So we're kind of falling a little bit behind and just wanted to do an FYI. I don't want to. um, No, no, I think that's super helpful. We're kind of out of it right now until we can come back up. Um, I'm not even sure I can get my CAPIT information in on May 7th because everything is in my files and I don't know, I can't get access to them and I don't know what's been encrypted and what hasn't. So that's yeah. what's happening at Parkland. <laughs> well, it speaks broadly to the need for cybersecurity expertise. Um, oh my. <laughs> well, we've got it here, believe yeah. me, in force. <laughs> yeah, no, I, thanks for letting us know. But I think I think that, you know, that is always one of the tricky things is those kinds of things can kind of stop can stop things in their track. Um, and I appreciate you sharing sharing that with us. Is there anyone else that wants to join in? Questions, ideas, innovations? Hi, this is Bernie Papino at Hockey College. One of the things I, I had a note here, um, is there some type of grant from JFF that goes to the colleges? I, every once in a while I'll see a, uh, something I'll run across that says in your G, JFF grant, and I'm thinking, I don't know the JFF grant. Anybody else have one? So, Bernie, can you tell me a little bit more? Uh, so, I, I don't know of a, of a JFF grant that goes specifically to the to the college. I mean, we have a, a myriad of of contracts and and grants that we've done with partners across the United States, um, but there's nothing that's specifically open right now. Okay, that's all I needed to know. I mean, I, I just. It's on my list of things. I says, ah, I'll get Steve on the phone. I'll just ask him. He'll know. Yeah, well, smart. Good question. Um, yeah, we have a couple other projects where we have funds targeted for that. If you end up getting into uh, youth apprenticeships, give us, you know, high school or opportunity youth, give us a call back offline and we can talk to you about that. Get a couple other projects. Going. Uh, but those would have to be apprenticeships? Yeah, for in-school youth apprenticeship, high school and opportunity youth. And we're applying for another project. So. If we get that, we'll let you know too. Yep. Absolutely. Can you tell me um, the requirements for that? Because one of the areas that we covered is our dual credit, and our, some of our high schools have been dabbling with um, IT classes. And I'm just thinking, hey, this would be a great way to grab up some young people, um, get an apprenticeship with some business. Um, they're paying for books, tuition, and fees while they're going to Kish. The business gets to pick uh, the pathway, you know, for the student. Uh, obviously, it'd be a, a group uh, decision, but have input on the pathway. And the only bad habits that that new employee is ever going to have are the ones that the business taught them. Yeah. Uh, happy to have that conversation with you, Bernie. Once you hit me up offline, I'll tell you what we're doing. See if you're in that ballpark yet. Uh, okay. Happy to talk to any of you about uh, Andre is leading another project that's all about in school uh, print, registered apprenticeship programs for high school dual enrollment model, et cetera. Um, mm-hmm. So there is some stuff for that. Um, okay. But, you know, I've heard it all now. You know, we've got attacked by malware, uh, sort of like my dog ate my homework. But, uh, uh, you know, there's <laughs> so many challenges going on, um, and that's a tough one to get over. Um, you know, and then the competing interests, I thought your point was good about, you know, just trying to get through this semester with students um, is tough enough. So, uh, 
So yeah, so if a thing could go wrong with this project, it's probably gone wrong uh, uh, for folks, but I still think there's hope out there. I still think there's resources and certainly we would be happy to dig deep with any of you who are really either getting stuck or have some some ideas. Um, we'd be happy to talk to you about that. That's great. Thank Paul has his hand up. Yeah, not quite um, completely related, but tangential. Um, I'm working on a HRSA grant for a community health worker uh, that's a DOL registered apprenticeship. Um, and we're trying to locate sites to actually like have the apprenticeship uh, to host the apprentice. And one of the things that we're running into is because of what's been happening with the pandemic, um, you know, any, uh, you know, flexible funding that these uh, community health organizations had has been eaten up because they're not delivering services that are reimbursable. They're, you know, mainly trying to do testing and, and, and take care of uh, COVID related issues, which creates this, this problem where um, they don't have the money to pay the apprentice. And this particular uh, grant covers everything except a wage subsidy. Are there other resources out there where I might find uh, some support for some wage subsidy for community health workers? Um, to uh, participate in the SARSA grant? You know, if you could, you know, you could partner up with um, uh, Karen over at uh, uh, Chicago County Workforce Partnership, Chicago Cook County Workforce Partnership, um, and see, because they do have WIOA funds uh, that can support that. You know, our, we've had a lot of conversations with healthcare, folks doing work in healthcare, including a call uh, yesterday with HCAP, the Healthcare Apprenticeship Program uh, sponsored by SEIU and 1199. And, um, you know, even them, and they're, they're part of the healthcare system, right? The priority is, you know, PPE and COVID, and they don't have staff to train apprentices. And, but at the same time, there's going to be a growing need for them at some point. So Absolutely. a lot of the healthcare stuff is stalled. Uh, you know, my, my mega idea was, why don't we take colleges we know who can crank out curriculum on a dime, get the one-stop folks who are seeing thousands of dislocated workers and create some sort of short-term training for contract tracers, right? Um, uh, or contact tracers uh, that they're going to need for the system. I mean, you know, you, you guys could probably do, I think CDC already has a curriculum. You guys could probably adopt and do that. Um, uh, but but the, the priorities in healthcare are, are totally different. So, you know, I'm sure long-term care facilities are not taking on any new staff and what have you. So, so it's a challenge everywhere, but I would say uh, there's also a new RFP coming out from DOL on youth apprenticeship that does offer wage subsidy. So I don't know if anybody in Chicago region is going after that, but that will offer a wage subsidy. And then, you know, WIOA funds always uh, can offer a wage subsidy uh, if it's an eligible person, an eligible student, um, a veteran, a laid off worker, as long as they're eligible for WIOA, the, they could do that. So, but that you got to talk to your local workforce people about. Yeah, we're we're applying for the youth apprenticeship uh, DOL grant, and we have looked at connecting those two programs together as a way of right. kind of supporting that. So, but thanks. But I will definitely talk uh, with um, the partnership um, to see what they can do. So we're actually at eleven o'clock, um, and I know um, folks, this is kind of the end of our webinar. Are there and um, any last um, kind of thoughts and questions that you might want to pose to the group? In you can always email these as well, but just want to make sure we have that op that op opportunity out there. Just before I get off, uh, great webinar. Got a lot of great information from it. Thank you, Paul, for all your help. Great, that's great to hear. Thank you. Well, good luck, everybody, and don't hesitate to reach out to us. Yeah, at all. I mean, you can always do have our emails. Um, if there are any questions that you want to pose or something that occurs to you afterwards, just shoot Eric or I an email um, and we'll do our best to get back to you. And we're keeping our eye on uh, Capitol Hill to see what's coming out of Congress. We're keeping an eye on the Department of Labor guidance. Um, so uh, next time we chat, we'll see if we have any updates for you on all that. Great. Thank you both. Um,
Andrea, will you be able to share the slides with everyone? We can PDF those and send those out to everyone. And I'll also send, like I did last week, um, you and Eric's email for questions. If people have questions, please reach out to JFF directly. Um, they are a great resource and um, there are no silly questions as we're moving through this process. And we're really, I know it's all over the media, but we really are all in this together. So we're here to support you in whatever you need um, moving forward. Um, with that, any closing comments from Whitney or um, LaVon? Um, I just wanted to um, let folks know that I took some notes in terms of some of the challenges that you guys are experiencing and particularly some of the challenges, uh, Bobby, that you brought up at Parkland. So um, I'll bring those back to the team. Um, additionally, um, Amy, we have a learning community call next week, right? Yeah. Or the week after? Yes. Um, um, I believe it's so, um, the 13th, yeah. Yeah, it's the second Tuesday. Second Wednesday, sorry. We have... Yeah, so we have a, still a few more continued engagements to help you, you know, keep engaged and, and to help sort of work through some of these issues. And as Andrea mentioned earlier, we've been in communication with the Department of Veteran Affairs. And so, you know, this summer, early summer, we're hoping to um, have a webinar or two or a, or a conversation or two um, about um, and with Veterans Affairs. So be looking forward to that as well. Absolutely. All right, thank you everybody. I hope everyone stays safe and healthy and the weather hopefully turns around for everybody. Um, and I wish you well. Talk to you in a few weeks. Thank you. All right, thank cheers. You. Bye bye.